Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is Paul Sims speaking to you from IFA Pharma in London once again. And welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is called Agile Pharma, as you can hopefully see in front of you on the screen. Uh, and as you can also see, it's how an agile iterative design thinking approach enables greater learning and guarantees commercial success. That's a big claim, of course, but we're going to talk about how it might well indeed be possible. So a quick word about um, why we've done this uh, webinar. Well, I suppose um, there's there's a strong motivation. Obviously, Agile is not a new topic in, in, in pharma even, um, and it's something that we hear about a lot. Um, but commercial pharma has been a place of somewhat incremental and steady improvement uh, over the last few years, and that's been absolutely necessary and absolutely correct, given that we have to take a safety-first conservative approach. But certainly as we move towards um, designing things which are more complete solutions beyond just medicine, as we design for value rather than just designing for the next sort of transaction or the next sale, we definitely feel that um, some of this agility and this agile approach is necessary, uh, particularly given the uncertainty that uh, some of these new projects are actually facing in terms of the marketplace. So we're looking for a brand new mindset. We're looking for uh, a process that reduces um, years and months to days and weeks. Um, and obviously it requires using digital uh, in a way that quickly yields results. Uh, so a combination of mindset and digital. So um, we're going to you know, see what that takes, uh, see what it takes to bring that new mentality into the workplace uh, and how some of these digital processes can indeed accelerate innovation and create the learning organizations that we would like to create. Um, and there are, of course, some people joining me. Um, you can see Lars on the top left. Um, I want to say a particular thank you to Lars and his team at Ignatio because they uh, have uh, really um, ensured that this webinar even happens today uh, and uh, been, been working with us all along in the design uh, and setup of the, of the webinar today. So hugely grateful. They've been a great partner to work with on this. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll hear from Lars very shortly uh, and that you can uh, all speak to Ignacio yourselves uh, post-webinar. Um, so Lars, by the way, has been CEO of Ignacio for coming up to about three and a half years now. Uh, he's actually an experienced C-level executive in the consulting services and very validly this time uh, software industries. Um, so, so really useful to have uh, Lars's experience here um, and uh, definitely has, has developed, shall we say, the toolbox um, for uh, working in this digital mindset manner uh, and, and finding new ways of improving communication. Uh, and, and, and value uh, amongst our teams in pharma. So uh, really, really valuable stuff that he's been working on. Um, underneath Lars, we have Morton. Uh, he's the chief growth officer and, uh, oh, sorry, I've, I've got that wrong. Sorry, to the bottom right is Morton. Can't even uh, look at my own slide here. Uh, he's chief growth officer and head of the incubator at the Leo Innovation Lab. Uh, Leo is a company I always describe as a leader, even if it's not the largest company, because some of the work they're doing is, is genuinely innovative and, of course, very patient-focused. And uh, Morton's certainly been at the cutting edge of that. In fact, he's been working at the Innovation Lab, which doesn't focus on medicines, but at uh, alternative uh, solutions and, and has been doing some fantastic work there. Morton himself is, a, is an expert in growth hacking, which uh, is certainly uh, an essential part of getting agility right. So really keen to hear more about what Morton has to say. Uh, and then um, I'll, let's go back to where I should have been. That's Davidek. Um, Davidek on the left there. Uh, Davidek is what I would describe as an up and, up and coming uh, future leader of our industry. I think he's doing some fantastic work. Always a refreshing insight. Has been uh, fortunate to join me on a stage a couple of times in the last uh, 18 months or so. Uh, he's a focus. He's a specialist in digital marketing uh, and customer experience and commercial excellence. Um, and he actually created internal sales at team, uh, team at uh, Teva that was actually sold off for a large amount of money uh, and uh, has, has achieved some very interesting things with AI and machine learning in Teva also. So really great to have you here, Davidek. Thank you. And last but certainly not least is, is Sarah. Now, Sarah um, isn't working in the pharma industry specifically now. Um, in fact, she's just created her own consultancy, Speak Up Consulting, but she was until quite recently the chief marketing officer at Truphone, and before that was uh, in a very senior position also at Google for five and a half years, um, and uh, has actually a very, very strong pedigree in being able to transform 
um, attitudes uh, and processes um, within companies uh, towards a more agile mindset. So uh, absolutely right that you can be here, Sarah, and really appreciate you doing that for us. Um, the first thing I'm actually going to do, rather than handing straight over to my uh, panel, is uh, ask you this question. What is agility? We thought we would actually start by attempting to define it a little bit. So, um, yeah, what is it? Um, well, here's um, the definition that I wrote actually up on the sign-up page for this webinar. The Agile approach is a way of working designed to give the maximum probability of results in situations of extreme uncertainty. I've already mentioned uncertainty in the, in the lineup. And that's why this approach is used by startups who almost by definition are always approaching uncertain marketplaces. And they've got very few resources. Uh, and the way in which they can guarantee good results to win investment or whatever it is that they're trying to do is actually to use the correct metrics that are going to be adapted to an uncertain environment. Uh, and I think that uh, we can learn a huge amount from that. Of course, the word agile came originally from the software development area. Um, it's actually over 50 years old, believe it or not. Uh, and this is um, the uh, definition which, uh, which has been used uh, in the past uh, regarding that. A little bit long, so I'm not going to read it all out to you. But as you can see, there are some keywords in there: self-organizing, cross-functional teams, evolutionary development, early early delivery, and continual improvement. So, uh, a lot of words and, and phrases that I think you'll probably already be familiar with. And then finally, this is the definition which I personally have settled on. This is I've been something of a student of this area now for for a few years, uh, and uh, this is my own definition: a rapid build, measure, learn, iterative process that focuses on the creation of quick solutions and market-based understanding of what works. And of course, that's designed to bring innovations more reliably and more quickly. So, uh, so that's that's me. Um, but I'm going to hand over now to Lars, um, who's going to present a couple of slides and actually expand on this a little bit. So, Lars, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, as always, uh, it's a pleasure to to join here, and it's a pleasure to discuss a topic that's very close to my heart, having spent uh, half my career, at least, in in software development and in technology. And um, I uh, happen to work with. Uh, with agile thinking as well as design thinking uh, for a number of years, uh, and I like your your uh, definition very much. Uh, originally, this comes from uh, you know Japanese corporations uh, starting to work on on lean, uh, moving uh, many years forward to American corporations such as Apple, uh, delivering software in a completely new way, completely designed towards uh, the user and the customer experience. Um, and this uh, term agility brought along with it the ability to deliver you know in regular and swift in regular and swift pace continuous pace um, along with that came you know terms like lean startup allowing uh, companies to focus on how to get as fast as possible to sort of a, a minimum viable product and um, and in recent years of course design thinking where we focus on maximizing the value we deliver to the actual customer. Uh, mixing those three is perhaps what's necessary uh, for pharma uh, as we speak and as the pharma industry dives into new ways of working. Um, the new ways of working are probably for most pharma companies uh, necessary because many of you guys are in sort of three to five year product cycles. Uh, you're in annual budget cycles and you're in sort of multi-quarter product launch plans. So ahead of farmers to you know, identify you know, what to deliver, how to deliver, and how to maximize the value as quickly as possible, even if it takes failing uh, some of the time. So, uh, so ha having a look at some of the fundamental uh, topics uh, that you need to address as uh, pharma organizations, I'd like to share with you the, the next slide, please. Paul, are you okay to click the next uh, slide, please? Yeah, sorry, I'm just uh, having a couple of issues, but don't worry, it's coming, it's coming, I okay. promise. There we go. Cool, thank you very much. Cheers. So I have the great fortune to speak to a lot of pharma executives, and um, most of them will describe their change efforts as uh, described in that triangle they are starting from the bottom moving upwards. So uh, rather lengthy change management initiatives, uh, that'll define technology maps, 
And uh, once you've done that, maybe it's taking a couple of years, um, ultimately you end up discussing what the customer engagement should actually be like. Um, and in, in several organizations, I can see this being sort of a three to five year process as well. Uh, funnily enough, same time it takes often to sort of launch a new product. And, and in many cases, unfortunately, the engagements never actually come through in terms of better engagements. So if we click uh, on this slide uh, build up uh, here for a moment. Thank you. Another way of looking at your change efforts could be to start with the customer engagement and look at how to customize them to the actual needs uh, of the end customer, of the patient, the consumer. And then defining on the basis of that, what could the enabling technology uh, be? You know, how to make that as simple as possible, basically, to deliver it as quickly as possible. And then just as in the, in the words of, uh, of agile thinking, to actually make sure that from the get-go, you capture data that you can use to improve yourself, that you can use for the continued learning. Uh, it's sort of the outside-in survival trick that I'd like to be the advocate for in, in uh, life science companies, uh, because if, if, they, if these initiatives were all to be driven you know, in a corporate traditional way, then we'll end up uh, speaking again in a year or two uh, on the exact same topic. So I'd recommend, of course, uh, this outside-in approach. So if we look at um, at what uh, what we might get out of it from a commercial point of view on the on the next slide, well, uh, then uh, we we'd want to apply uh, agile thinking to our commercial activities, and of course, uh, as I mentioned before, that means being customer centric, uh, actually testing everything you do not in great length, but as quickly as possible to be able to deliver some value uh, straight ahead to uh, the consumers. And, um, and a helping trick is often to think digital uh, from the, from the get-go, uh, to basically make sure that all of your campaign elements, all of your product launch elements and so on, are all uh, born digitally. You know, that typically will lead to a faster and also a better commercial success. Um, and will also allow you uh, to reap uh, greater learnings more quickly. Um, so you know, those four topics are typically the ones we discuss uh, in, in workshops across the pharma industry. But speaking of learning, let's have a quick look uh, at, a, at an example uh, based uh, on, on data. If we go to the, the next slide, please. Now, uh, this is sort of a, a, a typical example of a dashboard that can be applied either to the individual user who's in, you know, in your pharma company who's engaged in the campaign, that could be the sales rep as you see up there at the top left hand corner, it could be the management level or it could be the brand team uh, executing the actual uh, commercial activity. And looking at an individual country and looking at some of the country data and looking at the key messages and the channels applied and so on, you can start measuring some of your campaign progress on a relatively quick um, manner so that you can make iterations, uh, make adjustments and changes on the basis of actual data captured from the market. And if you look at the sort of the gray line at the bottom there, uh, it's maybe an example of a campaign where you can see that progress is not coming as you'd like it to. Uh, and so at some point in time, you make adjustments and you see an uptake or pick up in the actual results from uh, from those campaigns. So this is sort of an example of leading indicators that you wanna look at uh, in terms of estimating whether you are engagement with customers and whether your efforts to make those enga engagements as good as possible, if they are actually su successful. And it's only once you marry those leading indicators of your efforts with the lagging indicators of your revenue sometimes weeks or months later, sometimes it's difficult to, to marry the two, but it's only then that you find out whether your efforts uh, have actually been successful. And then, uh, so I've always recommend that the focus on any change project, if it is to be an agile uh, happen, happening, that it's based on leading indicators of your actual efforts. And that takes it being as digital as possible and thought agile from the, from the start. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, 
hand back to uh, to Paul and in, and of course uh, indeed our our great panel of today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lars. That's um, really interesting and always good to see an example. In fact, I like these examples so much that I think at this stage we should ask our panel to to also add whether or not they've got any uh, any examples or ideas that can uh, that can uh, can work. So, um, who would like to go first? I know that Morton, you've got an idea or, or uh, two, perhaps even from outside the industry that you might be able to share. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, in the digital space, uh, which is a very comfortable space to work in because it's it's very quickly to change uh, your product offering. Uh, we've got loads of examples, uh, and one, if I want to mention something from from outside the pharma industry. Uh, I used to work in the in the content industry where we could. Uh, I was heading up a, a music streaming service, and we pretty much knew everything about what the users were doing, and we could uh, identify that if users during a 30-day trial hadn't created their own personal playlist, we knew with 80% accuracy they wouldn't convert to paying users at the end of the trial period. So after seven days, if they hadn't uh, made any playlists, we would start multiple activities uh, to try and, and stimulate them to, to see the value of the product so they would create their own playlists. And obviously with the amount of data we had, we could do that very, very segmented. So we could look at uh, your age and your gender and what preferences that might indicate. We could also see what had you been listening to previously to suggest something that might be relevant for you to add to a playlist. And obviously with segmentation, uh, we needed to do that automated. So, so we were able to do something that was very, very targeted to the individual user with multiple different communication loops all being carried out, automated, uh, based on the activity that we've been able to map out was the key indicators of, um, of bringing customers on board to our service. Um, that's from outside the industry. From inside, we, we've tried to, to bring in the growth hacking methodology, which is this uh, rapid iteration in, in marketing and sales uh, digitally. We've, we're in the process of bringing that into the pharma part of, of Leo. And one example we were testing bringing people onto a landing page to sign up is we were testing whether or not to place the logo, something as simple as the Leo Pharma logo, at the top of the page or at the bottom of the page. And uh, the general assumption, and this is why I like this as example, the general assumption was, of course, we should place the logo at the top because that would indicate authenticity and it would indicate, you know, um, uh, profound knowledge into this area. Only thing was that converted nearly uh, half as good as the one without the local, otherwise completely similar, uh, that landing page. So, so something that was a, a, a definite certainty with everyone proved to be wrong. And that's, that's what I like about this uh, approach of, of build, measure, learn, is that you can you reduce the amount of effort you base on hypotheses. Those would be my initial examples. Yep. So, so morning. That's uh, this is Davidic. Yeah. Uh, this is really good. Good point you had there. So it almost outlines kind of my methodology around this agility, right? So obviously we know business agility is the ability for an organization to, to really sense the changes both internally and externally, as you pointed out, with your customers. Um, but then to be able to respond accordingly to deliver the value to the customers at the end of the day. So for example, let's say in industry, what we see is let's say even down to our internal customers, let's say our field sales force where if we now start to see that we're delivering these digital assets to them that are not being utilized accordingly, at least the way we think they should be, we can then respond. And that's actually made us more pragmatically take more of a modular approach for certain brands. So in the past versus this giving one piece of content for six month blocks, now we start to tear that in little pieces to your point where we're actually, to your point, how you did with the music industry with your customers and kind of do that with our sales reps in the field. Um, but again, it's, it's the ability to be agile, but listen and that, that's the quick thing because agility is not a transformation it's a process right and it's just the better we can listen to our customers it gives us the ability to be more agile and i guess like the lean startup kind of methodology or approach to that because you made a, a good point right build um and what you said said build mean and lean right so it's uh you don't always have that straight plan right sometimes there's bumps in the road but if you can actually predict that in like say for startups what they try to do is they build test build test build test versus even myself I'm, I'm victim to this as well i have a budget for 2019 i plan accordingly for it um i have one project and as you know you, you have three or four months of, of design and build 
then you launch, then you test for another month, and then then you go back. When ideally, maybe we should take more of an agility, agility approach, and and maybe cut that off into week cycles. But again, it's tough in our industry, but there there could be some examples of that. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Anything to add? Yes. So I think the approach is very much from I guess born from my Google days when it's become relatively well known now within the digital and, and outside space in the whole concept of 20% time. And in Google days initially, that was very much centered around enabling and empowering engineers to devote 20% of their time to tinker with products that they came up with that they presented back to the board. And if it were a viable business product, it would then be invested in. We then adopted that approach very much on the commercial side of the business to encourage a much, much more agile way of working that very much centered around adapting fast, testing and learning and failing fast. And again, empowering people culturally to fail fast. So the specific example that I'd like to cite is from my recent role as global CMO of Truphone in the telco space. And we agreed as a board about this time last year that we wanted to launch a new Internet of Things solution at Mobile World Congress in March this year. So we gave ourselves six months. At the time, we had no product. We had no team and we had a phenomenally minute budget. So tested a number of hypotheses as to how we could deliver on that in the absence of appropriate finance or resource. And it really, really tested our ability to change and change on the fly in that we created teams. And by the way, we still had to deliver on our day jobs and all the, all the normal KPIs in addition. Um, but we created a cross-functional team with a very, very strong project management lead that led a different level of discipline and focus to that that we were normally used to. So that entailed in this specific instance, a combination of people from tech, from product, on my side, from design, from marketing, from sales and strategic partnerships. And every single week, something about the end product or the process changed. From a marketing perspective, we led completely with a digital first approach all of which was based on, on customer and competitor insights. So on an almost daily basis, we were looking at the data coming back from customers real time to determine were we still on track? Could we actually deliver a minimum vi viable product by March this year? And I'm delighted to say that we succeeded in it because A, it was based on data and insight. B, we were tracking and measuring real time and see, I think there was an appetite across the business for us to ensure that we were delivering a truly engaging customer journey throughout. But inevitably to do that, we had, a, had to have a completely closed um, loop marketing process. And that, that process is still ongoing. Um, the product continues to change, again, based on data and feedback. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting example of the rapid iterative process of building, measuring and learning. And a big part of that is the cultural piece, in my view, um, in that it does require a fundamentally change, different change in mindset often. But empowering employees to fail, which is alien in many, many organisations, and I'm sure very much so within the pharma space, is no bad thing as long as they learn from it and fail fast. Thank you, Sarah. Some really, really good stuff there. Um, what I would like to do, I mean, I think um, we've had our eyes opened, uh, all of us, by, by some of those examples. And what I would very much like to do is actually encourage the audience to have a say. Uh, we don't want to just be uh, talking just amongst us uh, during this, the rest of this session. Um, we want to, to involve you as an audience as well. Um, so, so we're going to do that in just one second. But um, uh, before, well, the first thing I'm actually going to do is to show you these slides because we actually asked you a few questions on the way into this webinar, believe it or not. So here's what you actually said uh, already. Where in your company do you see uh, the, the most uh, 
uh, potential for fast-paced change and agility. And there's a clear feeling that marketing um, is, 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 and we obviously did uh, send this uh, webinar to a very general audience as well. Uh, so marketing is clearly the, the opportunity zone for us. Uh, so that's something that we all, uh, we all saw. Uh, and then secondly, um, sorry, I'm just having some trouble changing slides here. There we go. Um, so this next question, obviously, uh, has your company delivered customer felt improvements during uh, using digital technology in the past three months? So the no's uh, numbered just over 200 and the yes is um, both up a little bit higher than that. So obviously um, more than twice as much as the no's. So, you know, we, we obviously are doing some of the right things. Um, but I'd like to, I mean, uh, before I move on, I mean, does Lars, do you have any, do you want to have any comments on this? As obviously you were co-designing this, this webinar with me, any comments on these graphs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, both surprised and also encouraged by uh, by the data in the in the pie chart you showed previously. You could say that uh, potentially marketing is always going to be at the forefront of your commercial activities, of your market-facing activities. So it's it's natural. It's also great to see though that uh, that marketing are the, the part of the organisations. Uh, being the ones who are delivering it in a most sort of fast-paced uh, nature. So, so I think that's uh, it's encouraging to see. Uh, if we look at the uh, the bar chart on the next slide, there, uh, I'm really positively surprised by the fact that uh, that not only uh, are almost 300 respondents saying yes, you know, in the last three months, which is in 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 pharma terms often a rather short time period we have delivered uh, customer felt improvements uh, using digital technologies. And in fact, that almost as many are saying, you know, yeah, we are learning from it. We have cre created this uh, build, measure, learn uh, loop, continuous improvement loop. So that's really quite encouraging. At the same time, and this is where I sort of say there's still room for improvement, I'd say that the gray yes bar you know, let's try and convert it into the yellow yes bar where we actually have learnings uh, to go along with it. And of course, let's try and see if we can uh, maybe through this webinar bring uh, new new knowledge in to actually convert the no sales to trying out uh, delivering in an agile uh, manner. So that'd be my my comments on the two. Can can I uh, Thank you, add a comment? Yeah, go for it. Go on, go yes, on. I think, I think I'm also um, uh, positively uh, surprised by the number of, of uh, participants saying they have actually done customer field improvements. Uh, I think what's important though, back to the topic of agility is um, how quickly can you do it and how quickly can you adapt to uh, the changes or the insights that you, that you get. Um, if you can only have one iteration a year, then you will be saying, yes, we did something customer felt but it's gonna be very slow for you to evolve. So, so the shorter you can have the iteration loop, the faster you can uh, evolve and the less you base your activities on hypothesis. So, so it, it's great to see that um, a great number of people are seeing that they actually do something uh, more outside in, but to the point of agility, the, the pace and frequency is, is very, very important as well. Yep. Yep. And this is David well, as well. Just add to that. Yep. Just to add yep, that as on. well. Uh, one thing I do see here, I'm curious if you can dig a little deeper into this, is are a lot of these potentially pilots, right? Because obviously, when it comes to, to agility, you kind of want to stay away from the pilot approach. Because even in, in my company, we take that. I kind of take that approach where it's, it's I don't like pilots. It's either we change or we don't. Um, and back to Suzanne's point as well, it's right. It's kind of you want people prefer to to try to, and fail than to really never try at all, right? So it's um, I'm curious if this is this just activity for activity's sake, or is it truly making an impact on the customer? And that's one thing I noticed specifically in this vertical is we do a lot of great activities, specifically in digital, but it's very fragmented. And again, it doesn't overarchingly align to that overall strategy and that journey where we're trying to head to. That at the end will bring that better patient experience. So it's it's I'm curious if there's any way we can tell a little more about the breakdown of that. On a, on a slightly um, related note, I'd also like to um, comment on the previous slide. So firstly, as a, as a seasoned marketer, I'm delighted to see the positive belief that marketing has the best potential 
to lead fast paced change. I think there are a couple of caveats there. One is the degree to which that may be aspirational. Um, and I think that's often because marketing is not necessarily consistently valued across all organizations. On the flip side, I think that we have a better ability than ever previously as marketers to lead fast paced change, to drive a level of agility, because arguably we are the glue between arguably every other area of our business. And if we're not, we should yeah. be, because it's very much our roles to remain curious, to work with our product colleagues, inevitably with our, our field sales colleagues. And so the list goes on from finance to compliance, to procurement, to legal, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm delighted on the one hand by a very positive belief. I wonder though, the degree to which, as I say, it's aspirational versus actual. If it's actual, fantastic. Yeah, in, in well, theory, you're right there. Yeah, it thank you everybody. Right um, in, 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 oh, never mind. Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, this is called Sarah's point, right? It's, it's the fact that also I think what, what drives this pie as well is marketing pretty much owns the budget there as well. So they have, again, not only the maybe the want, but also the, the leverage to do that change as well. Yeah. 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 Okay, fantastic. So I said that um, uh, I was leading on to, to making the, the session more interactive and, I, and so many of the um, helpful uh, comments you've just made on these two graphs actually lead into some, some audience questions that I've prepared. So I want to go to the first of those if that's okay and that's going to give us a lot more fuel for, for the rest of the conversation. Um, so take a look at your screen right now. You'll see a question pop up on it. Um, so what are the greatest barriers that you see towards a more agile and flexible style of campaign planning and uh, execution? Is it the entrenched mindsets and culture, no sense of a burning platform and you know we can just continue as, as, as we always have done? Um, is it because of compliance and regulatory and the, as I said at the beginning, the necessarily conservative approach that we've been taking? Um, is it because we have an obsession over short-term revenue goals and the learning which of course is the focus of many of the metrics in, in true agile or true uh, lean startup development um, is actually coming in second place. Some of you might remember an article I wrote about that not so long ago. Um, is it the lack of senior level buy-in and support? The, your, your, your top teams don't necessarily understand or, or appreciate this. Or finally, it's a, a question of competencies. We simply don't have the skills. We don't have the the, the, the actual uh, on the hand tools to do it. So that differs obviously from the first question about mindset. So uh, I can see that around about 40% of you have voted so far. I'm gonna hold that open for five more seconds and we'll hopefully get most of your results in. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much everybody. Let's have a look at those results. So, um, yeah. Well, I think it's the uh, the, the compliance is uh, fair, quite squarely in the uh, double barrels of our uh, shotgun here, I'm afraid, um, uh, with uh, significant minorities on the uh, short-term revenue and the lack of senior level buy-in, but uh, otherwise it's a fifth to the others as well. So um, interesting, interesting results. Um, have we got any comment from the panel on these before I skip to the next question? Yeah, I, I can I can say that I'm I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, we can I think I can um, recognize this very much from from the activities that we are doing. Um, uh, you know, one one example is when we uh, design content to use in multi-channel marketing for for the the pharma part of the business. Uh, we very quickly encounter um, that approval process are very often one size fits all. So regardless of the type of content, they go through the same approval procedure. Again, coming back to you know uh, the um, not being able to segment or have granularity to look at relevance or to look at different segments, and that slows down uh, the iteration process uh, because that approval process is unnecessarily long. It also has in it, I think, um, uh, the fear of failure. You could say this is the conservative approach and not the mindset and culture, but I think they are, they are uh, linked uh, because of, of how the regulatory uh, departments are incentivized. So I can definitely uh, recognize that as one um, uh, major hurdle to, to being agile is to have approval processes that are more pragmatic and, uh, and shorter in, uh, in, uh, in time. 
Can I just say before the other panelists, thank you for that, by the way, uh, Morton, but can I just say um, the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen, everybody, um, hopefully you can, you can even see it. Uh, a few people have been asking questions, which I'm going to come to very shortly, but do please make sure that you throw in your personal and specific questions uh, for our panel. It's the only way to make sure that we uh, cover exactly what you're looking for. So do please use that questions box and throw it in. So any other comments from the panel on these, uh, on these questions before I move on? on these results, should I say. Silence, okay, well, uh, clearly well, uh, more than said at all. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I think, so I'll, I'll add to my own comment then. No, uh, <laughs> one, one very positive thing is that um, uh, there's a lot less uh, concern or friction with lack of senior level buy-in and focus on short term, so, so the ability to, to focus on long-term strategic goals in actually developing these capabilities looks to be there, which is a, which is a very positive uh, uh, starting point. Yeah, 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 Morton, I, I, agree, I agree with that as well, right? And, and give example that, whereas we have a vision here on where we need to go, we understand what we need to do, but to your point, execution is, is where a lot of companies get stuck, including ourselves. And, in, and it comes back to a couple of fundamental things, right? It's the, the people strategy. Right, so behind all of this has to be some kind of people strategy in regards to this education and understanding of really what we're doing, why we're doing it. And, and obviously, we know there is a lot of gray areas there. And to give you a pure example of, from a compliance perspective um, around social selling, specifically in Europe, where originally uh, we, we thought we couldn't do it, but we really pushed. And we actually were able to do it and found out it was a very compliant thing. Um, but more importantly, it really gave a really good customer experience. So it's um, there's, sometimes you just have to, you know, navigate through the smoke storms and again also about you know take really calculated risk as well sometimes if you don't take some risk i mean you're never going to achieve so it's uh, but i know in our industry we're really risk adverse but we, we have to to think different and make change because if we don't do anything it's going to be bad so it's so there's yeah. a couple points there but morton i agree 100 percent maybe i can maybe i can add a quick comment there because i i can see uh large reasons for concern in uh, the combination of the top and the bottom uh, uh, answer there you know if if there's no burning platform and we don't have the competences you know then i certainly see uh, some executives uh, of which most of them don't believe that they represent a barrier i see them needing to go back to work and actually make organizations and processes and technology that allows uh, you know the company to build up the company, uh, the competences, and and that actually creates a sense of urgency. Whether it's a burning platform or maybe rather a burning desire is of course a debate. Um, but but uh, certainly I think it's pointing right to the C level uh, within uh, within the pharma companies to uh, to fix something that seems to be fixable in order to actually go uh, towards a more agile uh, campaign planning and execution. I can definitely in large, to, to get a more example, what is that you think? Because I know you talked to a lot of executives as well. What do you think needs to be fixed? Is it is it the 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 backbone, the digital backbones? Is it the, the way the company is actually structured? Is it the risk that people are able to take? I'm, I'm curious from your site. What, what what do you see? Yeah, thanks. I kind of touched upon it. You know, it's uh, it's looking at all your change efforts from an outside-in perspective, sort of as a as a fundamental uh, principle. Uh, then I think it's the empowerment to. Uh, I think Sarah, you spoke to that very well. The empowerment to actually allow people to fail fast. And then, uh, as uh, as I think Morton, you spoke to, it's very much a question of fixing uh, what seems to be the biggest of the handbrakes here. Uh, you know, the compliance. Uh, processes, uh, regardless of the type of, uh, of activity that we're trying to execute. So those would be sort of the top three for executives to, to fix. Yeah, I, I can totally second that. I, I think one of the big issues here is uh, in, in order to reduce the, the fear of failure uh, and, and adapt the agility, you need to also create a learning organization. So that's that's the flip side of, of failing fast is that you you actually learn and it's a little bit of the hen and the egg you know how did you create the right mindset or do you allow the right mindset to appear and and so one of the fundamentals i think need to be put in place is uh data and and the right insights because what what i found is that um if you don't have insights you stop asking questions you know you stop being curious because you can't find the answer anyway 
and that means your your um, uh, your wantingness to evolve is high reduced. But on the other side, if you add data and if you add insights, people will start automatically to build hypotheses, which allows again to have a much more pragmatic approach. It reduces the risk beautifully because you're not basing too much of your future business on one assumption or hypothesis. So I think uh, adding insights and the capability to or the ability to actually track and monitor your 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 activities i think is a is a massive driver in the cultural change i agree and i think that's something that other sectors do better as an outside observer um it's interesting because just going back to the to the comment about sort of leading from the top and the c-suite having to adopt a different mindset different way of thinking that can't be done in isolation and that sound might sound very obvious but actually one of the things that in my experience has worked incredibly well is having doesn't matter how how we categorize them but in essence change ambassadors across different disciplines within any organization to help embed a different way of using data a different way of learning and therefore create a more collective appetite for change has been pretty successful in other industries that i've worked in or with my other observation would be that at the moment, the pharma sector is all man eat man, dog eat dog. We can think of umpteen other analogies, i.e. everybody is fighting for market share. Everybody is fighting for appropriate levels of profitability. What I'm seeing in other sectors is a much, much better level of collaboration across the sector between often competing organizations and i wonder whether there is an opportunity to adopt a more collaborative approach within the pharma space or whether that's a naive aspiration from a non-pharma expert so the the whole concept that we're seeing more of now is the idea of collaborative advantage rather than what we've traditionally viewed to be competitive advantage within business. Okay, um, really good points there. I'm going to ask the audience another question if that's okay. I want to get through a couple more of these before we uh, finish. We've actually only got 15 minutes left, time flies. So um, have a look at your um, screen now. This one is very much more about the, the purpose of, of uh, the agility. Well, when I say the purpose, I mean, the, you can see the question is about what kind of agility do you seek? But actually, um, it's very purpose oriented, this question. So when it comes to your multi-channel customer engagement towards HCPs, payers, etc., what kind of agility do you seek? Do you want to be able to scale resources easily and dynamically? Do you want to quickly test the many hypotheses and get quick results? Do you want to be able to say yes to more campaign possibilities, more ideas, more possibilities? Uh, or do you want to be a, a true learning organization, as Morton was just pointing out? Finally, I've given you an option if you uh, don't feel like you know yet, uh, not sure yet, still familiarizing myself. So let's uh, hold that open for another few seconds. I can see, again, we've got 40% of, of people voted so far. Let's have a look at what everyone thinks in three, two, one. And thank you so much, everybody. Let's have a look at those results. Okay, um, it's relatively uh, even with the exception of the uh, want to say yes to more campaign possibilities, but a uh, reasonably good showing on, on all of the other results. Obviously tied there in with a third for the testing hypotheses and becoming a true learning organization. I have to say uh, that fourth one is very endearing to my heart as I believe that's been a, something that's really held a lot of our companies back is, is been the focus on, on profits rather than on the metrics that demonstrate customer conversion and actual learning as to what creates that conversion in, in, in behavior uh, for a customer. So I'm really pleased to see that. Um, so panel, any, any thoughts based on, on this result? Well, from my side, uh, I'd love to uh, combine two two of the answers again, looking at the the one you just pointed out, uh, Paul. You know, wanting to be a true learning organisation, it sits so beautifully with the second answer there, wanting to quickly test many hypotheses. You know, it's exactly what you need to do to become a true learning organisation. So I think, yeah. I'm, I'm with the audience uh, for sure here on on the uh, how uh, what, what's the important topics uh, when it comes to. Uh, yeah, there's definitely some overlap on these, isn't there? But yeah, yeah. great. Any I totally other comment? agree with. I totally agree with Lars. I, I also think that it's very interconnected, and I and I think it's again super super promising because there's a lot of 
um, uh, willingness to move. I mean, obviously, most people signing into this webinar would be curious to, to move forward. But, but so I think there's a lot of grounds, again, for the top management to make this actually happen. I, I can't help thinking about the, the, you know, how to set up the right ability to, to actually make, uh, uh, to become a more learning organization and to actually get results and test your hypotheses. One, one example that comes to mind is, is uh, uh, and it's, some people don't necessarily even count this as multi-channel, but all the conference marketing efforts uh, being carried out in pharma, massive amounts of marketing budget, not just out of pocket, but also all the people attending and, and traveling budgets and whatnot. Um, and I think the reason why some people don't count it as multi-channel is because it's very difficult to track and measure the impact that cost has. And, and traditionally, that's been a complete black box. So a lot of the decision making I've encountered in pharma is, so why are you doing it? Well, we, we always do, right? And that, that's, a, that's, that's not learning. But, but now you've got platforms like Affinity that actually allows you to, to track and measure, you know, and, and set up uh, metrics to follow your return on investment on, on marketing. And I think those enablements will drive forward a learning organization but the, the people I've seen who who tested a platform like Affinity, the minute they see the data they can get, they start to be curious, and then that's that's is that will drive forward the testing of hypotheses and the and the the learning organisation. So I think it's a lot about creating the right environment and um, and capabilities for for the top management. I mean, for the top management to create that for the organisation. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, right, I'm going to keep keep the pace going, if that's all right with everybody, and move on to another question. I think the reason I'm just cycling through these so quickly is because uh, we've actually talked about um, all of these things in the conversation already, and I just want to see what the audience's opinions actually are. So let's have a look at our screens yet again. Um, in any given campaign, currently how many iterations do you typically see in a year in order to adjust to customer responses, customer feedback, etc.? So Morton was talking earlier about uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, this this sort of velocity of, of campaign as being a key key thing. Uh, so let's see what what the actual reality looks like. We did actually ask a similar question in a previous uh, webinar as well. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing whether this concurs with that. So you can see the options there very simply: at least 12 once per month or greater. So that would be a probably a, a true agile organization. Six to 12, two to six just once. There are no iterations once a campaign is initiated or certainly no, no major iterations. Or finally, impossible to say. Perhaps uh, it varies so much within your organization it's impossible to say. Okay, I'll hold that open for another three seconds. Three, two, one. Thank you very much to everybody for voting. Let's have a look. Okay, so um, it's a bit of a normal distribution, isn't it? Um, there's certainly not very many of us that are truly agile at the top of the of the scale, and there's certainly a a tend towards the bottom here. An unfortunate quarter of you saying that um, once the campaigns are launched, no matter what they are, they uh, they stay that way, um, and there aren't uh, those iterations. So uh, that's a little bit more of a disappointing answer, I feel, than the than the previous ones, wouldn't you say, panel? I think it's very funny to see this in in, uh, in in connection to the one about have you done something that's uh, based on your customer? Yeah. Because yeah, it, exactly. it, it kind yeah. of says how how much are you capable of evolving? And if if iterations take that long, you know, from two to twelve months, basically, uh, then uh, it's very difficult. You know, that there will be a tendency to you to 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 really make a one size fits all and squeeze all your communication, all the the sentences you believe have potential into the same material because you never know which one is the perfect one and ah, you've, you're afraid that you're going to miss out on the one that was actually brilliant. So everything is going to be very one size fits all with the consequence that it is very likely very irrelevant. And it means that it's also very difficult for you to predict what part of your communication is worthless and what part of your communication is priceless. So so that is, that is um, uh, definitely a problem. And I, I just like to as, as perspective, when, when we uh, do our campaigns for the purely digital products, we will very often have upwards of 50 iterations a week. And the, what we do uh, now with Leo in, in adapting this growth hacking methodology, we have um, between 40 and 60 iterations a month 
Uh, so, so you know, that's that's a that's a uh, quite a bit more rapid in terms of setting identifying a high bar exactly. for us there. <laughs> setting a high bar there. But, <laughs> but the, the learnings are great, and again, you are reducing the risk by not um, uh, basing too much on hypotheses. It's it's only you know a small step forward every time. Mm. Okay. I agree. Anyone I else? think I'm. A I'm certainly a big fan of the approach that Morton has outlined in that it inevitably enables validation that the campaign is the right one and that the, the marketing and Marcom's decisions made are correct. My fear with the one size fits all approach is it's kind of spray and pray is how I would categorize it, which is wave it out of the door keep everything crossed that something sticks and it resonates with a section of the customer base, whether that's ultimate patients or HCP. Um, you know, getting closer to the approach that Morton is talking about, I think would enable um, a better level of customer centricity than we're currently seeing. And it, and it, it doesn't, and it, in a way it doesn't, you know, just to to um, reinforce what Morton said, it doesn't feel that it mirrors the responses earlier. It sounds like certainly that uh, in order to to move in the direction that uh, that you point out, Morton and Sarah, you you second so well. Um, you know, there's a compliance. Uh, issue that needs to be fixed you know the, the first it seems the first area to make agile is uh, the compliance right because that was one of the the outlayers in a previous response uh, by the audience yeah. you know, that you know and, and this may may just be the bottleneck for uh, increasing the, the the cadence here yeah, yeah. and, and yeah, interestingly, guys... just just to add to that Lars, i think it it goes um it goes back to some of the elements that we were talking about earlier of, you know, could the industry as a collective therefore chip away at the compliance issue en masse and would that enable speedier, more agile decision making? Yeah. I think there's actually, there's a lot to be done for the industry in that sense, because I think, you know, we need to obviously be very concerned about patient safety, but I think we've, we've as an industry created a situation where what we're doing is not in the interest of the patient. I mean, th that few iterations is definitely not in the interest of patients because we are not capable of actually promoting the products and the treatments in the right way to the physicians. And that's not in the patient's interest. So I think there's definitely something to do. But what I also think is, is uh, often overlooked is actually the regulatory constraints aren't as strict as most pharma companies make them. It's basically down to the people hired in, in the legal departments and, and in compliance. They're incentivized by keeping the company out of trouble. And the best way to do that is to not do anything or at least not do anything new. Uh, so, so that very often drives forward uh, an approach that is much more rigid than the law actually says. So I think it's, yeah. it's, there's a lot to be done also on a company level in just being pragmatic and, and actually basing decisions on and procedures on an actual risk assessment. Yeah, and more than to add to that as well, again, it comes down to the reality. And you mentioned 50 or 60 iterations of a, a piece of content, right? That can be done in certain channels, uh -huh. but certain other channels when full approvals have to go through again, I mean, just our system can't support that, right? So it's more even a system limitation outside of people's risk. Um, let's say levels. So it, to your point, there there is a lot of change that has to go there, but you have to start somewhere, right? And I like what you guys have done, and we're taking a similar approach in our company as well. Um, but we have to start somewhere. But it comes down to really the, the systems, the structures that support that, and then also obviously the level of risk that we're willing to take. Okay, guys, and um, we've not we're running out of time, and I really want to um, just bring a few audience questions in um, before we go. Um, I'll just read out a, a few few of these, and feel free to take whichever one resonates with you. So, um, how can agile be realised with regulatory departments lacking any digital mindset? Um, obviously, we're, we're talking about this now. Um, you know, there's there's surely a reason why the innovation lab sits outside of Leo and not within the usual structure. So. Um, you know, speaking to what you just said, Morton, how can we actually uh, create some change there? Um, how uh, how can we be more end user focused uh, as an organization in markets where uh, the local legal constraints are actually limiting the access to end users as well? 
so so there's a double-edged sword there with that one. Um, oh, there's quite a lot of questions here. Which one shall I choose? Um, lots of stuff about compliance. Wow. Um, if you uh, if you would have to choose one key practical, easy to be implemented message regarding being more agile, what would that be? So <laughs> someone uh, asking you to to, to select there. Um, how can we communicate agility of value inside the organization when the decision makers are naturally conservative and procedural? Um, and uh, do you ever find yourself holding back when dealing with agility? So there's a few few audience questions for you. Does any, anyone want to so take I, any of them? I'd, I'd like, to, I'd like to, to offer an answer to, to a couple of them uh, addressing the, the, the compliance issues. And I think, you know, one approach is to, to not handle branded and unbranded content in the same way. Now, obviously, uh, you know, the risk in that communication is different. And uh, if you look at uh, an acquisition funnel at the beginning of the funnel, you've, you've got higher volume and more traffic, and that's where you need uh, more agility to, to experiment, less so at the end of the funnel. So, and that could typically be where you'd use the unbranded content, which actually does not have nearly as many restrictions as the branded content. So just that very pragmatic approach actually offers a lot of flexibility and then try to go for an approval of concepts so so you so you've got you know multiple images to choose from multiple pieces of copy to choose from uh, and so on and so forth so you give yourself a framework in in which you can you can uh, iterate more freely and uh, yeah, I would add to that and say, uh, you know, uh, what we did at at Cisco, basically, when we couldn't get uh, our time to market uh, down, we put basically uh, the legal representatives into sort of self-steering teams together with the marketing teams with a joint objective to go to market as quickly as possible, as opposed to sort of two different functional silos uh, that uh, that were sort of communicating, uh, you know, on an irregular basis or at least not as quickly as possible together. I'm a huge fan of that approach, Lars, which is, I think, in instances where people have the same KPIs from different disciplines, things tend to happen more speedily. Yeah. And it very much resembles what we do with the Innovation App. Uh, we've got a, uh, the, the, the legal people and the compliance people here are much more concerned with driving growth than they are with uh, restricting new activities. Interesting. Okay, guys. Um, listen, um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm really sorry about that. We've already hit the hour. This conversation could go on for at least another 30 minutes. I've got lots of uh, actually brand new audience questions coming in. I even had a few more poll questions uh, prepared in the background, but unfortunately, we have to we have to end it. But uh, of course, if this is a topic which interests you, then I'm fairly sure that uh, our panelists would be very happy for you to reach out to them. Uh, I certainly would recommend Ignatio is a great place to go in order to work out on uh, some of the practicalities uh, in making this uh, actually happen for your organization. Uh, and, um, you know, um, I want to say a huge thank you to our panel for actually um, sharing uh, so many of their insights and uh, giving us their energy uh, today. Really appreciate it. Uh, of course, if you want more of this, then you can do so. We've got a couple of events. You've probably heard of them. Barcelona and Philadelphia are both coming up very soon. Um, both of them have incentives on at the moment for uh, early registration. So make sure that you uh, do indeed uh, take a look at the, the websites and, and find out a little more about those. Um, I'm uh, trusting that uh, many of the people on today's panel will also be there uh, at those two events. Uh, so um, you'll be able to meet them face to face and continue further with them there. And of course, as a thank you for listening this far along, uh, please get a, uh, an additional discount on your uh, past price by entering the code that you can see on your screen at the moment. Um, but um, as I say, um, it's been a very entertaining conversation. Uh, I feel like we've made some, some progress there. I feel like uh, we're going to need to take some notes uh, and listen back to, uh, to, to what, we, what was said. Um, there is a recording of uh, today's session available, and we're going to share that with anybody who was uh, registered for the conference, whether they uh, made it live or not. So you'll be able to uh, listen again and share uh, with your teams back at home. Um, would really appreciate uh, if you have any feedback uh, yourselves, since that uh, is uh, somewhat of the theme today. So before you go, please do use the question box to write uh, a suggestion 
or two uh, in there for what you'd like to see us cover next time, what you'd uh, like to do in terms of follow-up. And also on the way out, you'll see a few questions um, uh, which I would really appreciate if you could could answer uh, as uh, that, that information is incredibly valuable, not just to us, but ultimately back to you as we uh, iterate ourselves onto the next uh, session that we're going to do. Um, once again, a massive thanks to Ignacio uh, and to Lars's team for, for helping us create today's session and for, for, for actually instigating this topic. A uh, huge thank you to our three panelists, uh, David, Sarah, and Davidek, for um, being so so wonderful there with your with your with your answers. Sorry, Morton, not David. Not sure what I'm doing there, um, but really appreciate your 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 insights today, and uh, wish everybody a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks so much, everyone, and see you again soon. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks.